Donc, euh, nous avons le Sius Capital National. Pouvez-vous lever la main? Oui. OK, parfait. Bienvenue. Université du Québec à Chicoutimi. Je ne vois personne. Alors, je vais poursuivre. Université de Sherbrooke. Oui, OK, parfait. Euh, il y a le campus de la santé à Sherbrooke, puis il y a le campus de Longueuil. Donc, ceux qui ont levé la main, c'est le campus de la santé? Campus de Longueuil? Non, c'était le centre de recherche sur le vieillissement. Ah, d'accord. Ah, oui, il y en a trois. OK, parfait. Donc, euh, est-ce qu'il euh, y a le campus de, la, campus de Longueuil? Sherbrooke, Campus Longueuil, parfait. Et Sherbrooke, Campus de la Santé? Ok, il y a, il y a juste un, un site, parfait. Euh, UCAR, Campus de Rimouski? Non? Ah, parfait. Donc, euh, j'étais rendu UCAR, Campus de Rimouski? Non? UCAR Campus de Lévis. Oui, OK. MUHC. Est-ce que nous avons le MUHC? Oui, OK, parfait. Alors, il me fait plaisir d'introduire notre présentatrice, professeure Suzanne Jack, qui est professeure agrégée à l'École des sciences infirmières et membre associée, je vais le dire en anglais, Department of Health Research Methods, Evidence and Impact à l'Université McMaster. Donc, professeure Jack a une expertise dans le développement et l'évaluation d'interventions communautaires visant à promouvoir une parentalité positive et à prévenir la violence familiale, incluant la maltraitance d'enfants et la violence entre partenaires intimes. Au cours des dix dernières années, euh, professeur Jack a développé une intervention infirmière et un programme de formation afin d'identifier euh, la violence entre partenaires intimes euh, dans le programme de visite à domicile euh, du partenariat infirmier, famille et d'y répondre. Elle collabore également dans de nombreuses études pour évaluer et adapter euh, cette intervention à des programmes Nurse Family Partnership au Canada, aux États-Unis et dans d'autres pays tels que l'Irlande du Nord, l'Angleterre, l'Australie et la Norvège. Le titre de la présentation euh, pour aujourd'hui et Embedding a Process Evaluation in a Randomized Controlled Trial of a Complex Intervention. So, Professor Jack, uh, welcome, and uh, we are excited to hear you. Great. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, thank you very much to all of you, both here in Montreal and all of you, the rest of you across the province, uh, for the very uh, lovely and warm welcome and invitation um, to speak to you today about Uh, our experiences in doing a process evaluation uh, within the context of a randomized controlled trial about a nursing intervention. Um, so we have about an hour uh, together for me to speak and um, then about half hour I understand uh, for us to have a discussion with your questions. And in that time I really hope that um, we can come away Um, with an understanding of why you might think about embedding a process evaluation in any evaluations of interventions that you're doing. Um, if you're not familiar with process evaluations, I will review why we do process evaluations and what we can effectively measure within a process evaluation. And uh, in this time also to begin to think about uh, some guidance, some, some tips, uh, strategies for thinking about the the complex process of planning and doing and then sharing the results of a process evaluation. And then um, throughout this uh, conversation, I'm also going to share with you uh, our experiences and some of our reflections um, of a process evaluation that I have been leading. 
Um, because this is a group that is interested in nursing interventions, I think that it is important for me to contextualize this talk first and share with you a little bit of information about the complex intervention that we've been evaluating. And I suspect uh, in learning a bit about your network that all of you are very familiar uh, with the definition of complex interventions. Uh, good, I see nods, I see nods here. I have to put my glasses on to see the screen to see if there's nods uh, across the province. Um, but I'm going to talk about the nurse family partnership. So this is a complex intervention because it has multiple components. It can be delivered at different dosages um, and it, it varies very much in its delivery and its uptake. But at its core, the Nurse Family Partnership was developed over 40 years ago in the United States uh, by a psychologist named Dr. David Olds. And this is a nursing intervention where baccalaureate prepared nurses visit, um, they do home visits, a very targeted population of pregnant women uh, and first time mothers. So this is a, a targeted intervention compared to a universal intervention. And the population um, of women who are eligible is that they must be young, they must be experiencing social and economic disadvantage, um, they must be planning to parent for the first time, and uh, they must be enrolled in this program in NFP or the Nurse Family Partnership before the 27th week of gestation. And ideally we'd like to enroll about 60% of mothers um, around 16 weeks of gestation in pregnancy. Um, the intervention is delivered uh, by, I, again, as I said, baccalaureate prepared nurses. In um, Canada, in the two provinces where we are evaluating this intervention, in British Columbia and Ontario, uh, we have made the decision that um, this program is to be delivered by public health nurses because there's a long history of home visiting uh, populations of, of mothers and pregnant women. And in this program, nurses visit moms starting again early in pregnancy until the infant is two years of age. And it is a fairly high dose intervention in that the nurses visit weekly to bi-weekly across the tenure of the intervention. But there is a tapering process uh, because we are focusing on empowering mothers, building self-efficacy, that towards the end of the intervention, um, the visits start to taper down to uh, monthly. And the goals of the program are to improve pregnancy outcomes, to increase maternal economic self-efficacy, um, as well as to improve child health and development. In the United States, this is labeled an evidence-based nursing intervention. And the reasons that they can make these claims. In the United States, they say this is a nursing intervention where we promise to make a difference in the lives of mothers and children. And the reason they can make that claim is that in that context, this intervention has been evaluated through three long-term randomized controlled trials. Um, the first one started in Elmira, New York, uh, in, a, in a rural population over 40 years ago. The trial was then replicated with a predominantly African-American uh, population in Memphis, Tennessee. And then a third trial was initiated in Denver, Colorado with a predominantly um, uh, a population of Hispanic mothers with Hispanic background. And across these trials, and, and I'm not here to speak about the outcomes of this intervention, but it has demonstrated um, very robust outcomes in changing some very complex behaviors. So reducing substance use, reducing the number of cigarettes mothers smoke in pregnancy, in reducing, it's been shown to um, uh, reduce the um, time mothers spend on welfare, their use of food stamps. The long-term follow-up <coughs> has also demonstrated that nurse home visited mothers compared to non-nurse home visited mothers showed reductions in all forms of mortality which I often think as a nurse, why are we not screaming this from the rooftops that here is a nursing intervention that focuses on health promotion and we can see you know, 10, 20 years out that this intervention is showing reductions in causes of mortality amongst mothers and infants. Um, one of the greatest claims to fame for the Nurse Family Partnership or the NFP program 
is that it has shown the strongest evidence for being the intervention that is effective to prevent um, child abuse and neglect. So given the strength of the evidence of this nursing intervention, globally, there has been great interest in other countries saying, we want this nursing intervention. Um, so as part of a, a reconciliation apology for Aboriginal and um, Torres Strait Islander people in Australia, the Prime Minister there at the time, Paul Rudd, funded NFP to bring to Aboriginal populations. When Tony Blair was the Prime Minister um, in the United Kingdom, um, they had a strategy to address juvenile delinquency, and it, it seems that it was a brilliant idea. Some people were like, well, we shouldn't just address juvenile delinquency. We, perhaps this idea of prevention is a good idea. We should start in infancy. I think for nurses, we're always like, of course prevention is where you should start. Um, but many countries started to say, we want this program. So Dr. David Olds, um, who is the developer of the program in Colorado, saw this international interest. And I think this is a key lesson for anyone that's beginning to think about interventions and scale up, and scale up and, and e evaluation outside of your context. He was very wise um, to be able to articulate what are the core elements of his intervention. Um, he was also, he's always been very cautious that in other contexts, individuals will take this intervention and water it down. And that if they don't deliver it as it was developed and evaluated in the trials in the US that showed such great success, the consequence might be that countries are saying they do NFP <coughs> but don't get the same results. Um, so as an intervention developer, uh, he has actually licensed this program. So it is a licensed program where countries, societies, organizations that want to deliver and or evaluate this program must sign contracts and accept a licensing agreement. And core within those licensing agreements is that agencies agree to implement the intervention with strict fidelity to 18 core model elements. The other part that he has developed um, is a very systematic process for other countries to evaluate this intervention before they even deliver it. And in Canada, we've actually had a bit of a pushback because many of our community partners... Oh, okay. Is it okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Bonjour. <laughs> um, um, okay. So evaluate the four steps. Um, Dr. Olds has said, <coughs> just because this program worked in the United States, it does not mean that it's going to work. You're going to see the same benefits with different populations, different contexts. So uh, as I was saying, this has been a hard sell to community partners. We've had medical officers of health who say to us, it works in the US, we just need to implement. We've had provinces say, why can't we just implement it? And as researchers who value this concept of evidence-based nursing, evidence-informed decision-making, and with also deep respect for the spending of resources in our health system, we've really had to argue or um, persuade, uh, sell the idea of why you can't just bring an intervention, develop and evaluate in another country, and plop it into Canada. Um, so both the international NFP uh, program and our, our research team in Canada have had to follow a four-step process to bring Nurse Family Partnership to Canada. So the first phase has been to adapt the program for delivery in Canada. And Hamilton Public Health Services, a public health unit in Ontario, was uh, a very, um, they've been a great community partner. They agreed to be our first pilot site. And what it means to adapt an intervention is actually more complex. That's another talk for another day. Um, but we were handed a bunch of program materials, the materials nurses use in the home visits, education materials to train these nurses to deliver this program because it is an advanced practice nursing intervention. We had guidelines for the visits, implementation manuals. And um, I agreed to do the adaptation work, getting um, formative feedback from the nurses that were in the pilot. And I thought, how hard can it be? I probably have to change uh, imperial measurements to metric. Um, 
uh, it's much harder than that. There's language, there was content. In Canada, we, we have a greater focus on baby-friendly initiatives, on breastfeeding. Um, our standards of evidence, our standards from uh, the Society of Obstetrician and Gynecologists around um, even monitoring of fetal movements uh, is all different from in the U.S. So it actually took us about two years uh, to begin to adapt the program. But we were adapting it while nurses were delivering it. Nurses were actually using the U.S. model, and we, nurses were writing in pencil on forms and paper so that we could know what would make sense to adapt the program for nurses in the Canadian context and to meet the needs of young mothers. So the second phase, and this process of adaptation, I also want to go back to them and say it's not really phase one. Adaptation doesn't ever seem to end. Um, so we continue to adapt the program as we get uh, different funds. But our second phase with Hamilton was we needed to do a pilot study to determine is it even feasible to deliver a new intervention? Because this was a different way of practicing for public health nurses. In Ontario, most mothers are eligible for a single postpartum home visit. And here we're coming with a program that says we want to offer up to 64 home visits just to a targeted population over two and a half years. And somehow we have to find these young mothers who may be in foster homes, who may be experiencing uh, marginalized housing, who have, may have mental health issues, who may be uh, dealing with substance use issues. Somehow we have to find these moms really early in pregnancy. Um, so we conducted a, a mixed methods pilot study. We determined that it was feasible to deliver. It was highly acceptable to all stakeholders. And then that brought us to this third phase that I'm going to talk about. And that's now determining, um, does NFP work? Is it effective for a population of mothers in Canada? Um, as well as doing our process evaluation. So it is a, we had hoped to do the trial in two provinces. Um, but however, we, we couldn't. Um, and so um, there was a policy opportunity within the province of British Columbia at, at the, at probably in about 2011, 2012, there was a, a provincial interest in looking at children's mental health. They had a new 10-year plan. Um, NFP had been identified <coughs> as one of the interventions within their policy document. So another key lesson is always look for the policy windows and who's doing what uh, across the country to find those opportunities uh, to introduce new programs. Um, so we started, uh, we joined forces, myself and Harriet McMillan, who's a pediatrician and a psychiatrist at McMaster University. We brought NFP to Canada. Um, then we connected with our policy partners and our research partners at Simon Fraser University and a team at SFU under the direction of Dr. Charlotte Waddell, um, is leading the randomized controlled trial. And uh, so we've, we've, we're almost, we'll, we're, we've closed recruitment, we're still collecting data. Um, this is a hard intervention to um, evaluate because the intervention is two and a half years uh, long itself. It took us almost two years to recruit our sample um, and these are mothers that are hard to access clinically. They're equally hard to retain within a study. But we have two adjunctive studies to the trial. One is the process evaluation that I'm going to speak about, uh, which was generously funded by the Public Health Agency of Canada through their, their Child Maltreatment Surveillance Division, as well as my colleague Andrea Gonzalez has a CIHR grant uh, to uh, look at some epigenetic issues, to understand if a social psychological intervention can make um, changes at the epigenetic level and understanding the bio, she's collecting many biologic measures to understand um, can this intervention uh, make those changes across mothers and infants across the two generations. Um, so why did we decide to do a process evaluation? We have our randomized controlled trial, which was the, the main priority. We want to see does NFP uh, within this population of mothers um, reduce childhood injuries. So that's our primary outcome for the randomized controlled trial. And then we have a very long list of secondary outcomes related to uh, both infant health outcomes, parenting outcomes, um, and maternal health outcomes. Um, but we grappled with, well, why? Why should we do a process evaluation? And we recognize that this is actually essential 
in bringing an intervention to a new context. And the benefit of a process evaluation is it helps um, researchers, implementers to begin to understand what does the intervention actually look like in a new context. Um, it helps us understand the process for uptake and delivery, um, particularly a complex intervention. Our other challenge in doing the trial in British Columbia is we, we, had, we had great uh, policy partners. Um, the Ministry of Health uh, required the five health authorities there, the five health regions, uh, to deliver this intervention. Um, so we knew that we would have five very unique contexts, like every province across Canada. Uh, our geography is large, and you know the north of, of uh, British Columbia uh, service delivery is very different compared to what it might be in Vancouver and very different compared to what it might be in the interior or on the island. Uh, so we really wanted to understand how is this intervention integrated into existing systems and how is it delivered. Um, and we also knew at the beginning of the study that there is value to having a process evaluation because any time you do a trial, you can almost predict with a certain degree of accuracy that you're going to have some unanticipated findings at the end of your trial. So if you have thought well enough ahead to put in a process evaluation, hopefully you will have contextual data to help explain unanticipated findings and also be able to explain any variation in outcomes that you see in different contexts. So those are the key reasons why a team might decide to do a process evaluation. So what is a process evaluation? What are its key functions? The first, when you're doing a process evaluation, it allows you to richly describe the components of the intervention as it's actually delivered. Uh, I think we all recognize that what an intervention looks like on paper compared to what it actually looks like in practice are two very different things. A very core focus for our research as well as for um, process evaluations is doing a process evaluation allows you to determine if an intervention is developed, uh, is implemented with fidelity to the model elements. Um, so this was very key for us because we knew as part of the licensing agreements that there are 18 core model elements that make up nurse family partnership. So again, this is the foresight. If you're developing an intervention, come up with what are your core model elements or those elements that make your intervention. Um, the things that people cannot vary or change. Um, having those elements really helped us set up our objectives for the process evaluation. It gave us some indicators to be able to measure and to explore. Um, so that was a key question. Are sites able to deliver with fidelity? A process evaluation also allows you to document in real time how the intervention is being delivered and to be taken up. And then towards the end of the study, again, the key functions are being able to link how the intervention was de delivered um, with the outcomes that you have, have, have measured. So what can you measure in a process evaluation? So looking across the process evaluation literature, there are some very key um, components, uh, elements that are required to be a part of a process evaluation. So you're looking to measure, again, fidelity. <coughs> what is the dose of the intervention delivered? And what is the dose of the intervention received? What is the reach amongst your target population? What is actually the participation rate? A process evaluation also allows you to measure recruitment into the intervention, enrollment and retention. And in our process evaluation, not only are we measuring um, can we retain moms in a home visiting program, because globally in home visiting programs, the issue of re retaining uh, young mothers experiencing social and economic disadvantage in home visiting programs for a long time is a huge problem. It's always the number one question. How do we keep these moms working with their nurse for two and a half years? So we are focused on that, but we're also focused on workforce issues. We were also very much interested in understanding how can we retain nurses so another key aspect of process evaluations 
is that it gives you the flexibility to understand the delivery of the intervention as experienced both by the recipients of the intervention, but also to have deep insight into the provider of the intervention as well as the system issues. Um, and the reason that we chose to also focus on the retention of the nurses, because in our phase two pilot study, um, one of my master's students was involved in that um, a pilot study, and what we started to discover is that the nurses, the public health nurses that chose to work in this program were passionate and they were committed. Um, they felt almost that they had a calling to work in this program. And yet at the same time, the program was exhausting and leading to compassion fatigue. And nurses were really struggling with um, seeing, making a big difference in the lives of mothers that were really struggling and had so few resources. Um, and when those mothers uh, did have success, nurses felt so great. But we started to see um, nurses just really struggling. And uh, around the holidays, we'd even have nurses say, how can I buy my kids presents? I feel guilty buying presents for my kids <coughs> when I'm working with a young mother who doesn't even have some place to live. So we really wanted to deeply understand the dynamics of working in this job and how could we support nurses, retain them in this program, because the intervention is expensive to train nurses up in the program. So retention of both mothers and the nurses became a key focus of our process evaluation. And again, I've talked about um, in, in a process evaluation, you need to focus on implementation measures and also context. This context piece is so key to really understanding that black box of how interventions are delivered. And to think about context broadly, so when we were looking at what does it mean to do a process evaluation and understand context, we actually ended up breaking it down, that we wanted to collect data about the social community context in which the intervention was delivered. Again, we are doing this work in five different health authorities in BC, but we also understood that the context of an organization could have an influence. Then we went down to the level of the NFP team, uh, because every team has a supervisor who supervises no more than eight nurses, so that's one of those core elements, and each nurse carries a caseload of no more than 20 women, another core element. Um, and also then implementation in the home. So in context, we looked really broadly and we did level it, right from the community, organization, team, to that relationship work um, between the nurse and the family. So those are the key measures. Um, that we would look at in a process evaluation. Okay, so that's sort of why you would do a process evaluation um, and the key measures that you would look at in a process evaluation. But how do you do a process evaluation? So if you are uh, beginning to think about that there would be some value not only to measuring outcomes, but documenting process in your evaluation of any of your interventions, um, uh, building on the guidance from the MRC, from the Medical Research Council, Moore and her colleagues in 2015 uh, came out with some guidance um, in, in how to do this. And we planned our process evaluation before this guidance was published, um, but I think we did a, a pretty good job in, in, in um, achieving most of these, and this is very realistic guidance. Uh, the first one is to invest time up front in the planning. We have found that um, building strong relationships with our policy partners in the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Children and Family Development has been essential to the success of the evaluation, both the trial and the process evaluation. Um, and building those strong relationships uh, with the research team. We've also had to develop what are the parameters of the relationship. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to dissemination. Um, but what are, it's really important to develop terms of reference. We did create a governance structure for the research. Um, we carved out very clear roles within those terms of reference in the steering committee um, for practice, for policy, and for research. Because we're doing something kind of unique here. Um, we're bringing NFP and to, to British Columbia under the context of a study. We're doing a trial and an embedded process evaluation. 
But from the perspective of the province, they're implementing into their system a brand new program that's being mandated by five health authorities to deliver. So we have different agenda, we have different goals and different systems that we're each trying to navigate. And as all of you know, the, the rules of research are often very different than the rules of clinical implementation. Um, so our lesson learned there was the great value of creating a governance structure and developing very tight terms of reference. Um, we built research teams for all three of the main studies um, with researchers with a broad range of content um, and methodological expertise. So speaking specifically to the process evaluation, and I'll get to that, we, it, was, it was a mixed methods evaluation. Um, for anyone who has ever attempted to do a mixed methods study, there are a lot of work. And there's, um, <coughs> there's a lot of expertise required to do quantitative methods and statistics really well. And equally, if you're going to do rigorous qualitative research, um, that is also a very refined set of knowledge and skills. So we worked very hard to ensure that we created a research team for the process evaluation where we had quantitative experts as well as qualitative experts. And because our research team has experience in mixed methods, we also ensured that we had researchers that really understand what mixed methods is, that really purposeful linkages of the quantitative and the qualitative. It's not just here's a survey, here's our results, and here's some qualitative interviews. We really wanted a team that understood that there needed at some point to be some linking uh, between the data sets. So that took a bit of time, but we did um, get a great, a great research team for the process evaluation. And we also invited our policy partners from the Public Health Agency of Canada. So even though they were funders, we were already looking long term, and I, I suspect the, the idea of integrated knowledge translation to this group doesn't doesn't need to be explained, but we were looking ahead knowing um, that we would have to be thinking about dissemination and uptake. So we also ensured on our process evaluation that our policy partners were a part of the research team. And they work with us in terms of writing, in identifying the questions. Um, right now as we're beginning to map out publications, uh, many publications ask, um, uh, particularly in some of the medical journals that we're looking at, or health journals, they they are getting very specific around what is the role of the funder in the research project. So that currently, because we started really, we were you know welcoming everyone at the beginning of our study, now that we're writing for publication, one of our agenda items is to go to our partners and say, we need to be really clear in how we express and write this up in the acknowledgement, sent, acknowledgement um, component of a publication. Uh, because in no way did the Public Health Agency of Canada ever tell us what we had to do. They, do, they don't censor anything, but they are a partner, right? They're helping inform what we should ask about. They provide great guidance. They're helping us think through policy issues. Um, so that would be one lesson I wish we had thought of um, right beforehand, is thinking about um, the very clear role of policy partners in terms of writing publications and how we write that up. Um, a third thing in planning is to think about is the team running the trial and the team running the process evaluation, how closely are they linked or how closely or how far apart are they? And um, we have a significant, we have a mix of both and there's, there's pros and cons to every, um, every decision. We worked hard to ensure that we have lead investigators on both studies. Um, so myself, Charlotte Waddell, Harriet McMillan, and Debbie Sheehan are co-PIs um, on both studies. Andrea Gonzalez, um, who is the PI of the Healthy Foundation study, sits on, on all three studies as well. So all the leads sit at all the tables for all three studies. So at least we are aware of the issues, we're aware of what's happening, of the measures, of the methodological issues, um, aware with the process evaluation, what are some of the emerging findings. So that has been helpful, um, particularly for the process evaluation, because in the process evaluation, I had to make sure that we were collecting qualitative data over the course of five years that would be useful for the outcomes that we're measuring in the trial. And we really needed the help from the RCT team to say, 
what do you want us to ask <coughs> about breastfeeding? What do you want us to ask about intimate partner violence from the nurse's perspective? But we do have a large degree of separation that's geographic. The trial is run by a team in BC, um, and the process evaluation is run by a team in Ontario. So anytime that you can't have face-to-face -face meetings, um, that creates challenges for ongoing collaboration, cohesion, so we've really had to work hard to make sure that we, we plan out our meetings, that we have uh, structured agendas. Um, so it's, it, 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 is, it is working, but it's something that is important in the planning. Um, at the beginning, when we designed the process evaluation, you again need to be able to clearly articulate what is your intervention. What is the dose? Um, what are the core model elements? What is it that you're evaluating? Um, being able to figure out what are your priority questions to ask, because a process evaluation become, can become very huge. Um, particularly if you're doing a provincial um, process evaluation. Um, and I think the next slide I'll show you our objectives. Uh, we weren't very good at narrowing. We have like eight broad objectives and there's probably about four ideas embedded in each. Um, but we did have the benefit of being able to do this over five years. Um, we did do mixed methods, so that's another key element if you're thinking about key characteristics of process evaluations. Uh, most of them tend to use a mixed methods approach. Um, and the reason you would use mixed methods is that when you're analyzing the data, again, I said at the beginning, key functions of a process evaluation is to measure dose, to measure reach, participation, engagement, to measure fidelity. So you do need that quantitative component to achieve those goals. But to understand all those contextual elements, that's where you would need that qualitative um, expertise. <coughs> expertise. Excuse me. Okay. Um, the other key part, are there any trialists here? Are there any people who, who would say that their, their expertise is trial? So that's, thank you for putting up your, <laughs> putting up your hand. Um, one of the things as a mixed methods and a qualitative researcher, when I work with trialists, is um, I spend a lot of time, I don't know if it's coaching, encouraging, um, talking about the value of qualitative research and really doing some teaching about how we can embed this into trials. Um, so we have teams that are, have been very excited to implement this. Um, once people see the value <coughs> in embedding this qualitative research, the next strategy within a team then is also working together with our trialists, with our quantitative colleagues, about looking at how we can triangulate both forms of data. That again, it's not enough just to collect both forms of data, but really looking at how we can transform the data, how we can use numbers and stories uh, to, um, uh, to share our findings. So again, if you're thinking about doing a process evaluation, at some point those conversations might come up, and I would really advocate again don't just collect the two sets of data, but really have those focused conversations about how are we going to integrate it. And um, I, don't make the assumption that everyone wants to do that. So those, it's worth having those focused conversations. Um, and in terms of reporting, it's interesting. If I was to provide some feedback to Moore and colleagues on their guidance, um, I might recommend that the discussions around reporting the findings actually go back earlier to the planning stage. Um, because it's really important in terms of a process evaluation to have your key implementers and stakeholders involvement in hearing about how they want the findings reported and when they would like the findings reported. Um, and what is going to be their role in terms of reporting. So from the process evaluation, because we're getting a lot of qualitative data over the course of five years, and it's not a trial, so as our research team, we're not blind to the data, we're analyzing the data to inform our next wave of data collection, we are actually able to have findings <coughs> that we can share now with the, with, with the policy makers. Um, so we've had to connect with them to say, well, how do we share these findings? And we agreed that short communiques, so we, we developed short communiques, they're about two to three pages, 
of key findings that we do feed up to our steering committee and that do go back to the nurses and supervisors and teams. Um, but having said that, um, we've had to be very cautious as a research team to actually what are the findings in the middle of a trial that we can share. So process evaluation has its roots in, um, in QI or in QA, in quality assurance. Um, so originally, process evaluations were meant to be as you collected data, you could feed that data back into the system and improve your organizations. We're embedding a process evaluation in a trial. And we have to be very careful then about what data we're releasing about how the intervention is working because in no way do we want to change <laughs> the context or the environment or the intervention. If we see that things aren't going so well um, in terms of implementation, if we announce that and make a big deal about that, do people's practices change? And how does that impact? the um, delivery of the intervention. So we've had to be very thoughtful um, about what findings are, um, that, that we feel safe to share that won't influence the integrity of the trial. So again, the value of having the process evaluation and the trial teams uh, working closely together. Okay, so what did our <coughs> objectives, um, what did our objectives look like? As I said, we weren't very good at, at narrowing them down. Um, here's the province of BC and the five health authorities that we are working with. Um, so our first objective, um, in line with what I've said about process evaluation, was to determine the extent to which NFP is delivered to the 18 core model elements. And for the most part, we have been able to say, this is great, the five health authorities are doing a really great job implementing with fidelity to the majority of the model elements. But we did find that there were two or three model elements where they were consistently um, experiencing challenges to do that. And typically those were around the development of databases to collect data specific to this program for long-term quality assurance. Um, so we were able to answer yes, no. Are they implementing with fidelity or not? But what the process evaluation has given us is something I think even more exciting. So we can answer that question, yes, you're implementing these elements with fidelity. 100% of your nurses, you know, one of them is nurses have to be baccalaureate prepared. Because remember, the program comes from the US, where not all nurses have a, a baccalaureate degree. Um, so in Canada, we're like, yes, 100% of the nurses um, delivering the program have a, have a bachelor's degree. Another uh, core model element is that the program must be voluntary. Mothers must volunteer to be in the program. They cannot be coerced to be in the program. So we were able to tick off that within the health units, through our process evaluation data, we can see that they market the program as a voluntary program. The way that the nurses describe the program to the referring sources is they highlight the voluntary nature. Um, we've been able to document and understand how nurses describe the program to the young mothers, that there's a process of describing the program, getting consent. Um, so our process evaluation helped affirm that. <coughs> but what we learned, what we didn't suspect, is that some of our partners in the child welfare system are mandating their young moms. And the nurses are saying, we're doing everything we can to say this is a voluntary program. But we're starting to see safety plans with young mothers who are involved in child welfare. And in their safety plans, they're going to the judge and saying, this mom has to be in this program. And so the process evaluation has helped us uncover some potential tensions between the child welfare sector and the public health sector. And everyone has the same goal, right? To have healthy moms and healthy babies. Um, but this has been able to allow us to identify an area that we can share back um, to say, here's, a, here's an area that might need more attention. And we had an opportunity to ask nurses, well, how might this issue be addressed? And the nurses have said, well, please, you know, our recommendation is can we go and talk about this program? Can we go and share with our partners in child welfare that we're not like other public health nurses, right? We're a more intensive intervention. Um, so we have had some unanticipated findings as well in the process evaluation around that fidelity piece. Um, the, our second objective is to measure the dose and recruitment and retention. 
Um, so that's fairly standard descriptive quantitative statistics. Um, what's interesting for me though, when I go to my quantitative colleague, uh, I'm always like, okay, I need to know um, what's the nurse's caseload of clients. And what we've discovered, this should be to me very simple, that a nurse reports how many clients are on her caseload. Um, and through blending our quantitative and qualitative data, um, that's actually an impossible question to answer, which it has been very shocking to me. So again, it really helps to have both the quantitative and the qualitative, because my quantitative colleague Andrew is going, I can't get you a dose number, the numbers are a mess. Because nurses are writing on their survey, well, I know I should discharge this client because she's disappeared. Or I see her sometimes, um, or I'm hanging on to her. So there's, you know, we're learning a lot about <laughs> uh, caseloads through, again, these two types of, of data. The other challenge in the process evaluation that we've um, uncovered is the really importance of having um, data sharing agreements. I think too late into our studies, not too late, we've, we're, we've done it now. I wish again at the forefront, so if I can share any lessons learned, um, to have, to really think through data sharing agreements between universities as well as between um, ministries and organizations. Um, so at the beginning, a lot of our quantitative data around service delivery, um, there was a data sharing agreement that it would go to Simon Fraser University. And then at McMaster, we're like, okay, well we need that data to answer the questions to the process evaluation. And under the original data sharing agreement, we actually couldn't send the data from Simon Fraser to McMaster. So we were quickly finding money to send our analysts to Simon Fraser. And we've s since been able to um, develop some amendments. Um, but five years, five, six years ago, the idea of having, really thinking through these data sharing agreement issues was not something that we all thought about. Um, so we're exploring the acceptability of the program uh, to a wide range of stakeholders. Uh, we're describing uh, nurses and supervisors' experiences of the education. And that was very purposely put in here, again, because uh, nurses complete probably close to 200 hours of additional education to deliver this program. Nurses are interventionists in their pro this program. They're not just assessing for problems and case managing and referring. Nurses are using motivational <coughs> interviewing. Um, they are providing um, assessment and guidance around the use of substances. They're uh, providing intervention around harm reduction. They have clinical pathways about how to recognize and how to respond um, to all forms of violence within the home. Uh, so we do need to train up nurses to ensure that they have those skill sets. And this, having um, a very key focus on education was important to us because to get the trial up and running, we were paying NFP educators from the U.S. to come and deliver this intervention. That's not sustainable. So part of the process evaluation was us being also being able to identify the areas um, that we needed to continue to further adapt in Canada and collect that information. So we knew we had to develop a model of Canadian education. So we used the process evaluation as a way to collect all the data from the nurses and supervisors about their experiences so that we could then adapt and build a Canadian model of education. Um, reflective supervision is a key component of the Nurse Family Partnership. So we really, um, earlier I said one of the functions of a process evaluation is to describe to describe the components of the intervention. Uh, this is what we're doing here. The core model elements say uh, weekly, every nurse must receive reflective supervision from her supervisor. So that's what we have to go by. Um, so we're exploring what is reflective supervision. And what we're learning is that some supervisors are very skilled in reflective supervision. Then in other sites, what we're seeing is that teams focus on clinical supervision, problem solving, right? So have you thought to refer the mom to this program? Um, have you talked to the mom about this? Have you given her this resource? That's clinical supervision, problem solving, thinking about resources, thinking about what the nurse can do next. Um, reflective supervision is a type of supervision where um, if a nurse comes back to her supervisor and says, I don't know what to do, I'm so worried about this client, I'm so worried that tonight 
I might see her on the news. What happens if her partner harms or kills her? And that nurse has all these emotions of fear and guilt and worry. Reflective supervision is a different skill to understand how those emotions are impacting the nurse's ability to do the work and that parallel process, how it influences her relationship with the mother. Um, so the pro through the process evaluation, we've actually been able to describe that in different health authorities, it seems that people are interpreting what supervision means differently. So again, we'll have a whole bunch of recommendations to give back to the program. We're focusing on um, contextual factors. Uh, again, we're, um, we have a very specific focus on necessary adaptations. And this actually was a key priority of our funder. And um, the public health agency, when they funded this project, said, Canada has a lot of rural and remote communities. How is this program that was predominantly tested and evaluated in large urban centers going to work um, in rural and remote communities? Um, so I have a PhD student that that's her entire doctoral dissertation is to, for the process evaluation, to figure out the intersectionality of geography with the delivery of a program. Um, and then we are also specifically focusing in understanding and describing nursing practice. How do nurses within this context recognize and what, do nurse, what does nursing practice look like in responding to young mothers <coughs> who are experiencing violence, substance misuse, or who have to engage with the child welfare system. Um, I've just finished drafting the paper on nursing practice with child welfare system. Um, and I, I know in Quebec, as in all other provinces, nurses are mandated reporters. And the guidance that nurses typically are given in any education program is if you sus suspect or observe child maltreatment, what do you do? You just make the phone call and you report. Um, through this process evaluation, we've actually been able to, um, we, had, we had 47 cases, so we asked nurses, uh, we pulled from the data 47 cases of the processes of how nurses do that report. And what we've uncovered um, is that it's not simple. It's not just that nurses suspect or observe maltreatment in the home and that they call child welfare to make a report. We've uncovered that there's a whole bunch of nursing practice that happens in between around how nurses do an assessment, how they make sure they're getting it right. Because nurses have identified that there's a key problem that as soon as they make the report, they're out of the home. And very often the mother, because the nurses will often say to the mom, I need to make this report. Will you make the call? I'll sit here with you side by side. Um, and in our process evaluations, the nurses have said, Here's the problem. No matter how softly we do it, no matter how we frame it, as soon as we make that call, that mother may go underground and disappear, or the worst case is the mother kicks us out of the home. She won't answer the door anymore. And the response from the child welfare system is often not more intervention. They'll come do an assessment, but very often additional supports are not put in place. So the nurses have identified to us through the process evaluation that one of their legal responsibilities they fear may be causing more harm um, than good. So we've really been able to unpack through this process evaluation what skilled nursing practice looks like and that we can't, things that we think are just simple, observe and report, are actually much more complex. Okay, so on to the methods. I think I've already alluded to the methods a little bit. It is a mixed methods study. Any time as a researcher that you make the decision that you're going to do a mixed methods study, uh, there's some key decisions that you need to make as a nurse researcher. First, is it going to be a concurrent study where the quantitative and qualitative components are done at the same time? Or is it going to be a sequential study, either with the qualitative being first and the, the function is more exploratory, or where you would do your trial and then add a qualitative component at the end um, for explanatory functions? Um, because we had the resources, because we had the uh, policy partnerships, um, and because it just made sense in terms of our objectives, we made the decision that it wouldn't be sequential, but that it would be a concurrent mixed method study, where both the quantitative and the qualitative were happening at the same time. Uh, the name of the design, the variant that we're using, is an embedded mixed method study. And typically, um, the in an embedded design, the qualitative component, its only reason for existing is because there's a broader quantitative study in which to embed it in. If we weren't 
doing the randomized controlled trial, we wouldn't do the process evaluation. Because the only reason NFP is being delivered in BC is because we're evaluating it in a trial. It's not part of normal system delivery. Um, so there's our primary outcomes for the trial. Our process evaluation, just to make things more confusing and which was really fun to write the grant application, is that our whole BC Healthy Connections project is a mixed method evaluation because there's the trial with the process evaluation. And then the process evaluation itself is also a mixed method study. And it's also a concurrent study. But I would say it's more of a variation of the concurrent triangulated type where we're co collecting uh, qualitative and quantitative data in parallel to triangulate or to find convergent findings. Um, as a qualitative researcher, I am a strong advocate that any time you say you're going to do a qualitative study, it must be informed by a design. Um, earlier, we were, we were talking earlier that sometimes people will publish something they'll call a qualitative study, and it's some open-ended responses from a survey, or someone thought it was a good idea to conduct eight interviews and maybe one focus group. And if I'm a reviewer, either for a grant or a journal article, I'm like, I don't even know how to review this because you haven't told me the design. So I don't even know the rules by which to critically appraise the quality um, of, your, of your study. And in our quantitative world, we would never do a study and not have a design, right? We say things are a systematic review or a randomized controlled trial or a cohort study or a case control. Um, so here's my plug as a methodologist. If you're doing a qualitative study, please select a design. Um, it really does add rigor. Um, so the qualitative component is informed by the principles of interpretive description, um, which has been uh, developed and advanced by Sally Thorne at the University of British Columbia. And this was a really appropriate choice for our process evaluation because this is applied health research. And we are looking at clinical questions and we're using research as a way to identify solutions that we can use back to inform and address these clinical challenges. We're also looking at these issues through a nursing lens. A huge component of the process evaluation is about improving the program, identifying what further adaptations, and building a body of literature about nursing practice by public health nurses in home visiting. There's many, many articles that document the quantitative outcomes of nurse family partnership. There are very few articles where we can describe what are the nurses actually doing? What does this form of practice look like? And our quantitative part um, is, uh, is predominantly quantitative. Okay, so I just have a few more slides and then we'll open it up uh, for questions and answers. Um, so our sites and our sample are what you would expect. Um, all five health authorities are participating. Um, and within each health authority, we are doing qualitative interviews or focus groups with nurses every six months across four years. Um, and then we also are doing one-on-one -on -one interviews with the key senior decision makers. We use snowball sampling. We did ask nurses and supervisors, who in your organization has NFP within their portfolio? and who best can speak to those organizational contextual factors. Um, so in total now, and I had wrote, written, our sample seems to change all the time. Um, we have well over 120 people in our study. Another lesson learned um, is people leave interventions. And midway through our process evaluation, we had to go back to ethics uh, because we didn't think ahead of time about the need to do exit interviews and to add specific questions about why are you leaving this program? And so we've learned a lot, so we quickly scrambled um, to be able to get ethics to do exit interviews. Naively, I thought, well, you know, we're gonna hire this first cohort of nurses and they're gonna stay with the intervention for the whole length of the trial. Um, apparently that didn't happen. Sometimes people move. Um, sometimes organizations move people out of different roles. Uh, so another lesson learned is plan for exit interviews. Um, our data has been mixed uh, because of distance. We do telephone interviews. My research coordinator and I do go to BC twice a year to do our focus groups and to do site observations, again, because we're, we're looking at organizational context and then collecting quantitative data about service delivery. 
Okay, so key points for reflection, and I've already started to talk about some of these. One is always at the start of a, of a research progress, think about your integrated knowledge translation strategy or your KT strategy at the beginning of the study. And uh, the using process of evaluations just creates a natural opportunity for researchers early on to engage with policymakers as well as the people that will be implementing the intervention. Um, so it was valuable for creating those relationships and those relationships also became very helpful to us in during the process evaluation. Um, our key stakeholders, if we were having troubles with recruiting nurses, um, in data collection, they were able to sometimes help uh, problem solve, uh, make things a bit smoother for us, as well as having um, our policymakers and our implementers involved. Uh, we could go with them when we were struggling with questions of interpretation. But along the way, we've had to um, really be clear that as researchers, we would seek their input about interpretation or help us understand contextual issues but there's no censorship role here, right? Like they can provide input, but we are still gonna interpret the data and provide our interpretation and our discussion. So nothing can be, can be changed. Um, and this is a, just an example. I've already talked about, you know, thinking about carefully what findings you do share while the trial is going on. Um, and then on the right-hand side, that's just a little example of some data that the key bullet points that we do share back with policymakers in our communiques. And we've also publicly posted all of those on our NFP Canada website. Um, a really key point, um, and as, as we start to move to dissemination of the findings, is really to support all the researchers on our team uh, to value and embody the idea of using numbers and stories. So in, in December, we did release the baseline report describing the demographic characteristics of the women in the trial, both in intervention and the control group. And so from those numbers, um, amongst all women enrolled in the trial, what we were able to see is that there's a fairly high degree of experiences of violence, both in their childhood and at the time of enrollment in experiencing intimate partner violence um, when they enrolled in the study. So you can see that it's about 50% for partner violence and 56% of those young women in the trial who had experienced uh, child maltreatment. So this is our quantitative data. At the same time, we made sure that from nurses, we were also collecting data about how they identify violence, uh, their clients' experiences of violence, what does that look like, what are the narratives that clients are sharing about this type of violence. And when you combine the two, it's so much more powerful. Because it's one thing to say women experience intimate partner violence and they were abused as children. But through our qualitative data, we can actually see how um, that these women are experiencing multiple forms of violence and how intense it is. So these are just a few quotes that I pulled um, from some of our transcripts of nurses describing the types of child maltreatment or violence. Um, so one example. Um, the father of my client was extremely abusive, physically, sexually, emotionally with her, my client, her siblings, and his wife. This woman's ex-husband comes and shoots this guy dead in front of the baby, and he's shooting at her. This changes our understanding of how this program is being implemented. Again, it's one thing to have those numbers to say about 50% are experiencing violence. What we are learning is that while nurses are delivering this intervention, these young women are living within homes where violence is so normalized and people are being shot at. Um, another example, um, the young mom, she was leaving her pimp and was scared that he was going to come and beat her up. She found some place to go, but her friend kicked her out as this man called the friend and said, I will kill you if you let her stay here. My client grew up in foster care because her mom was always on drugs, prostitution, violence, anger. Um, so just, again, if, for those of you who do mixed methods, you just see the power of having these two forms of data um, converge and really provide that rich contextualization of the outcome data that we collect within the trial. Um, so final points for reflection. Um, you, you need close collaboration between the two research teams. Um, we, we do have regular meetings so that we can discuss these issues of implementation. 
um, in qualitative research because we were always changing our interview guides. We made sure that the trial team were giving us feedback on what those questions should look like. Um, uh, and how are we going to use these findings now? So we are immediately using these findings. That's another nice thing is sometimes policymakers don't want to wait seven years for the results of a trial. Um, so we are able to give them some findings from the process evaluation in real time. Also, as the team responsible for furthering the adaptation of this intervention in Canada, we collected our data around the education in 2014. And now we have used that data from British Columbia to create our online modules for the Canadian model of nurse education. So that's a, uh, an example of our Moodle, our Moodle platform. We're using Moodle as the, as the platform um, so that we can create online education. So all of that data that we collected from the nurses, we are immediately using now to continue to adapt this intervention. So here's my last slide and just uh, in final thoughts that uh, if, you, if you are evaluating an intervention to think broadly about not just measuring outcomes but to embed a process evaluation um, that this is an essential part of evaluating complex interventions where the dose uh, will, will be quite var variable and um, that process evaluations at the end of a trial will provide you with so much rich data. If you find yourself in a position of having a negative trial and you might need to explain why it didn't work or if you see different outcomes or variants across different contexts, we're hoping that this great contextual data will give us some insight into why that might have happened. So thank you. Any, any questions? Do you start with questions from the other sites or start from questions here? Or any, uh, anyone goes? <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs> to start with, it was uh, very, uh, very interesting and very powerful to hear you. Thank you. And I think you kind of illustrated well the power of nursing interventions mm -hmm. and also the complexity but the importance of process evaluation and different ways of doing that, uh, which is quite challenging. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, I, I, I really enjoyed your presentation and I learned a lot. So thank you very thank much you. for sharing your, your knowledge. Um, so in terms of questions, we have about 20 minutes Sorry, left, I did go so over. My which apologies. is great. <laughs> um, so um, any questions from the audience? Uh, I, I know we have also um, uh, participants on different sites. So um, maybe I'm going to start with the audience here. Thank you for this very interesting presentation. Uh, I was wondering, you, uh, you told us it's very important not to, uh, what you say uh, during, about uh, the process evaluation during the trial, how do you decide what to say, what to not share with the, with the partners during a trial? This is, uh, I don't know if you have any uh, key uh, information about that. This yeah. is difficult. It, 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 is, it is very difficult, and if I were to do a process evaluation again, mm -hmm. those would be conversations I would put in the planning stage. Okay. Um, so part of it has been at our process evaluation team, when we're also very sensitive to the political nature of the intervention, mm -hmm. um, we, we, we have to just make some decisions where we go, this topic that they're talking about, we know is a political hot button. Um, we see from some sites, you know, there are different feelings towards having being forced to do a trial, in their words. Um, so there's, in many ways, no value to the researchers if to make, if people are displeased about a process that's already underway, we don't want to disrupt that, right? Mm -hmm. And people are working hard to build relationships. Mm -hmm. So some of those are internal discussions that this is not the right time and place, knowing that that would disrupt mm -hmm. um, so much work that's been gone into developing relationships. Um, there have been other times where um, there's a clinical lead in BC where because of these close relationships, we have been able to 
um, even do a little bit of a consultation. Uh, because there have been, one of the challenges with the process evaluation also is we go do uh, these great focus groups. And sometimes, if you've ever done focus groups with nurses or interviews, and they're talking about their passion, all of a sudden there's tears. And they're telling us about problems. And we say to them, what would be the recommendation to solve that problem? Because I want to write their recommendations. But we leave, and I fear that they think that I'm going to do something right now to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. So there's been a few times where we've actually had to do a consultation to say, is this the <coughs> kind of issue? Is, there a, is this an ethical issue or a practice issue or a safety issue to mm -hmm. nurses mm -hmm. uh, that needs some intervention? So mm -hmm. again, that value of knowing who to consult, whether it's another researcher mm -hmm. um, or having a partner mm -hmm. um, to, to, to speak about that. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we've learned as we've gone. So the value of relationships, I think, again, if I were to do it earlier, uh, we would maybe set out some parameters around ahead of time, a priori, what will be some topics that we know, regardless, we will share, mm -hmm. and then which ones should we just keep till the end of the study. Mm -hmm. Such as safety issues or ethical exactly. issues. Exactly. Otherwise, you would not interfere with the process. Yeah. Yeah. Because okay. yeah, there's been a few things I was like, oh, how, because you're seeing great things about practice mm -hmm. and a process evaluation. Mm -hmm. But you're also seeing some things that, neither good or bad, that are just done differently or there's variation within sight. Mm -hmm. um, if I went and announced that or we shared a communique on those, then it would, it would change the intervention, mm -hmm. right? The interventionist mm -hmm. may right. change their practice. Yeah. Um, and even though we're doing a trial in a real world setting, you know, you still have to be in that post-positivistic mindset in mm -hmm. a trial and objectivity and reducing bias. Another challenge of mixed methods, right, is just the different forms of data and mixing them. Thank you. So th thank you. Great, great question. <laughs> I don't have a great solution. <laughs> thank you. We'll know well, better for the next study. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Oh, can you press your yeah. microphone? Yeah, I have to. Thank you. Yeah. So while you were saying that in terms of you know what to share, not to share, and then your question, what I was thinking when you were saying that is that uh, being clinical trials, what I would want uh, the other process evaluation team to do is to unblind my intervention. Like for us, the participants are blinded. They, it, I, we say we have two different types of intervention. They're both equal, but they don't know which one they are going into. So if you would comment on some of the stuff and the content, it would totally unblind it. So that would be extremely worrisome. So mm -hmm. that would have to be an engagement that we would have to take prior to say, in any component, even if you see something great, you cannot discuss these aspects because it will unblind the trial. Um, yeah. For me, that would be a major thing. That Absolutely. Yeah. And our process evaluation, too, is only with the intervention arm. Yeah, but still, even but with still, the right? I, and, and I'm just putting that out for clarity. But abs but absolutely, no, but because even our control group is an intervention. It's the same intervention, same weekly, same same amount of time. So it's structurally equivalent. Okay. So it's like getting a white pill and a white pill, yes. and people just don't know which one is actually active. So it would make a huge difference. So um, and, and you don't want to, in in any way, also then reduce a potential effect size, right, between the intervention. Well, no, you, you, you want to see yours is better, but even exactly. the other one, uh, but, but not only that, I mean, if you want to see, you know, what really works. So for us, that would be a major thing to discuss. Um, and also, uh, just to, for the other people, it's Christine Mayu from McGill. Um, um, one question I had as well was some, when you start a clinical trial, then I think it, you would recommend that we also build in a process evaluation team right from the start. Um, so that, and then like you have your, you know, the, the BC and L, the uh, Ontario. And then my other question is, does both team then look for independent funding for their studies, or do you embed mm -hmm. the fund, the, the budget, the fund that it would cost within the big RCC trial, and we and say that you add an additional one third that would be kept for the process evaluation? Yeah. So what are your thoughts on that one? Yeah, I'll talk. What what we did do, so the trial in British Columbia is funded by the Ministry of Health, and the regional health authorities um, are responsible for covering the costs of the implementation of the program, the nursing salaries, and all the education. 
So we were in a very unique position with a provincial ministry that was agreeing to pay the implementation costs as well as the trial, the research trial costs. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, th this trial is quite expensive over so many years. Um, for the process evaluation then, the ministry, it is a bit of a blended model of funding, the ministry is, because they're paying for the implementation and the nurses, <coughs> uh, we consider that partly funding of the process evaluation mm -hmm. because they are paying for the implementation of the, um, of, the, of the intervention. To do the process evaluation, to do the research, we did have to go get external funding, um, which the public health, there was a call um, through the Public Health Agency of Canada, and this fit some priorities and we're able, we were able to get that funding for the research part. Um, moving forward, um, I think in terms of cohesiveness, if people are thinking about budgets, um, if you are able to develop a protocol right from the beginning that sees these, this as a mixed method study with a trial, with the process evaluation embedded, it's about value. It's about what we write sends messages about what's important. Um, if we write our protocol that way, that it is mixed methods, that the process of evaluation is within the trial, and ask for the appropriate budget, then I think we're saying we value both of them equally. Mm -hmm. um, and we were able to do that, um, again, another lesson learned, and thank goodness we, uh, we did it, is we did write our protocol. Even though we weren't sure exactly where all the funds were, the protocol at the beginning for the BC Healthy Connections Project did have the trial with the embedded process evaluation. It took us 18 months to get ethics through um, 10 ethics boards, mm -hmm. and thank thank goodness we did have both studies embedded because that saved a lot of a lot of time. So I think the ideal is right from the grant writing, the request of the budget, ethics um, is to embed them and write them together. Um, and again, to me, it shows the value that we are walking the talk. We're saying we value having both mm -hmm. of these. We value process and outcomes. Um, the reality with funding, though, is sometimes these are big studies. Um, yeah. We had a large sample size. We have a whole province. Um, these are large studies, and it's hard to get many pockets of. So the process mm -hmm. evaluation alone was just under a million dollars. Yeah, and I was thinking that, you know, when you apply, like, let's say to CHR, and you apply on the clinical trial, they, they won't take for granted that process evaluation, mm -hmm. and you they might cut your budget for that. It, it wouldn't, they wouldn't be considered as part of your C, uh, RCT. And CHR, um, um, when we first started, probably about 2011, 2012, uh, having conversations in Ontario about doing the trial, and we were trying to figure out, uh, uh, health units were excited to do this. They're like, we'll, we'll transfer pockets of money for the nursing salary, but it's finding people that want to do a trial. And even um, from CHR, we were getting a bit of response back of why, well, there's three trials in the US, the UK is doing a trial, why would we fund a trial in Canada? So we were actually very fortunate that the, the province of BC was willing to understand um, the value to do a trial, mm -hmm. that this is a good use of their resources, because if the program doesn't work, yeah. would we continue to implement it? The interesting thing, though, is there must be some connotations around the language randomized controlled trial, because moving forward, uh, we, we, the terminology is a scientific evaluation. The policy members said, we can't sell a trial to, to our community. Let's call it a scientific evaluation. Um, so even language is so central to having those discussions about. Thank you. Uh, I think we'll take some questions from the other sites. So um, any of you uh, online would like to ask a question to Dr. Jack? So you'll have to um, turn on your micro. No question, thank you. It, it was very interesting. Thank you. Same Other. thing here. No question. Congratulations for your presentation, your project. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other questions from the audience here? Yeah? I mean, just one last question. Uh, I was having oh, your microphone. microphone. Sorry. <laughs> Maybe state your oh, name and... Yeah. Uh, yeah, oh, there. Okay. Joanne Filiato, uh, University of Montreal. Um, I, I just one last question. Maybe you, you talked about it, but I, I'm not sure. Uh, 
in the outcome of the trial, was there uh, economic outcomes also? Um, in the trial, yeah. we, we are doing an economic okay. evaluation. Okay. So um, um, Amiram Gaffney, who is a health economist at McMaster, is leading that part okay. because we're comparing NFP to existing services. Okay. And we're not actually, um, the, what the control group looks like will be also very different okay. for women in all the different health authorities. It's whatever existing services, prenatal classes, going to a family doctor, um, so it was very important for us to have an economic evaluation. Mm -hmm. um, so that is included. We have collected those measures. And interestingly, the economic evaluations of this intervention in the United States, I think have been the saving grace of this program. Because the first thought that most policymakers have when mm -hmm. we talk about the dose of the intervention um, and that it's delivered by <coughs> nurses is this is too expensive. And because there are training costs and um, they're seeing mothers all the time, um, it, it, is, it is expensive. But in the states, because of the trial outcomes and demonstrating now upwards of 20 years of outcomes in criminal justice, education sector, health sector, um, social welfare, um, the best estimates in the states are that for every dollar they spend on the nurse and the delivery of the program, they save upwards of, I think it's $5.85. So we knew that for long term, if the trial works, if there's positive outcomes, um, that that was essential to build in because that economic argument, mm -hmm. economic argument for putting in a large nursing intervention, that's targeted as well, where we have programs in public health that really focus on population level interventions, universal interventions, that we had to have that data Long term to make to make the to make the cell. So yes, it's it's it was a priority and it's included included in the in the trial. Thank you and, and good luck. Oh <laughs> well, they, and just even on that note, it's interesting. The nurses in the qualitative focus groups they call themselves the ICU nurses of the community, and they say we have clients who are almost in multi organ system failure, right? So they have nowhere to live. They're young. They're pregnant. They grew up in homes where these moms have been part of the system often themselves. They might have been in foster homes. Um, so that multiple generation, mental health, substance use, child maltreatment, intimate partner violence. And the nurses say, we are addressing every part of their life. And we need to, they need one-on-one -on -one nursing care. Um, and so the nurses through the qualitative work have said, can you start to talk about this program as ICU nurses of the community? And one nurse in one focus group said, have you ever heard a hospital administrator complain about the cost of one-on-one -on -one nursing in an ICU? And I'm like, no, a hospital would never shut down an ICU, um, or we would never not have ICU services. So it's interesting to even hear from the nurses um, how they want us to start to build some of these economic arguments. So again, to me, it's always that richness of qualitative and quantitative, the stories and the numbers, and how are we going to use this to shape whatever's to come. We anticipate having trial outcomes. Our, we'll collect our last data point, because we collect up to 24 months of infant health <coughs> outcomes. We'll probably have early data 2020. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, Nancy, would you have a question? Is she? Ah. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, okay. okay, we have three minutes left. Thank, okay. Thank you very much, Susan. That's really such an interesting example of the gray zones that exist between policy, evidence, researchers, mm -hmm. and practice. It's, it's a fascinating story that you've told, and uh, I really appreciate your ability to articulate all of those gray zones and some of the lessons you've learned working in those gray zones with all of those different Thank you, Nancy. And also for your exceptional uh, discussion of a process evaluation uh, embedded in a clinical trial. Great. Thanks, Nancy. Looking, looking forward to tomorrow's presentation. <laughs> yeah. yeah, because there's another presentation tomorrow. It's uh, about your intervention, uh, the, the other one. Right. So yeah. tomorrow we'll talk about how you develop a nursing intervention for violence to embed in an existing intervention. Um, 
yeah, that's a whole other that's a whole other story. <laughs> so we'll do that tomorrow. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, because of time, uh, I'm going to ask you my question after. So okay. thank you, uh, everyone, for um, attending uh, this uh, very relevant uh, conference to nursing. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Remember your person.